Welcome everyone to our SpedNet webinar, Building Your Parent Toolkit One Strategy at a Time with Solandi Forte. This session, session one of two, the next one being next week, is Managing Challenging Behavior. We are pleased to have you joining us. I'm Eve Kessler, co-founder and executive director of SpedNet, and our tech consultant, Ali Sheffers, will be hosting this webinar. SpedNet was created over 25 years ago as a nonprofit to educate and empower parents of students with special needs to become their children's best advocates. In addition to our webinars and presentations, we have a terrific and easily accessible website with videos of all our presentations and webinars sorted by topic and speaker, as well as related articles and materials. We have published an excellent interactive guide to special services bringing knowledge to the table, how to be an effective advocate for your child, free on our website with paperbacks available for purchase. Today, we welcome behavior analyst, clinical social worker, and autism specialist, Dr. Solandi Forte, founder and executive director of Solstice Behavioral Health and Consulting. Solandi will discuss the functions of behavior and help you begin to build your own personalized toolkit. Solandi has served hundreds of children and their families as a clinician, consultant, and advocate, has coordinated with multidisciplinary teams, and is dedicated to working with leaders in the field to diagnose and provide innovative and efficient treatment solutions. If you find our information and support helpful, please feel free to donate to SpedNet. We're a nonprofit organization, and your donations go directly into programming. A couple of ground rules. Be mindful that this is an open forum and the presentation is being recorded, so we cannot guarantee confidentiality. You may not want to reveal any private information in your questions. Our webinar video will be sent out to all of you by email tomorrow or the next day and posted on our website and YouTube channel. So Landy will take questions throughout. And if you don't mind, please do not use the chat, but uh, type in your questions into the Q&A. Any information provided in this presentation is for general informational purposes only and is not intended to be legal or therapeutic advice. Lastly, this webinar is presented in partnership with Wilton Public Schools and the Newtown SPED PTA. Thank you, Stalandi. We'll turn it over to you. Thank you. So I'm really excited um, to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I think that the, the content that we're going to review today is sort of compressed. Um, I, I tried to put as much in there as possible to sort of tease you to want more um, because it's, there's just so much to cover, um, but at least leave today with a better understanding of what the functions of behavior are and maybe some tools that you can play around with. Okay, um, so I, I will accept um, questions throughout. So please, Ali is going to help me with this. Um, and uh, let's make this presentation what you all want it to be. Okay, a dynamic conversation, dynamic content that we can then apply. All right. So with that said, I do want to make sure that um, I, I introduce you um, to really positive behavior support. Um, and the reason why I start off with this conversation, uh, the, the conversation with this topic is because I wanna make sure that we have the information necessary in order for us to support our students and our children in the home setting and the school setting and the community setting in a meaningful and effective way, which means we have to keep in mind that we have to structure their environment in a way that is rich, fun, and, and sometimes functional. You know, we want to make sure that we take it beyond sort of just, you know, uh, a, a certain place or a setting or a program. We want to make sure that we expand our thinking and say, all right, how can we generate, you know, and formulate um, ideas so that we can promote um, learning, but more importantly, right, behavior change. We want to see that. So when we're looking at positive behavior support um, interventions, it, it's really, uh, we have to look at it and say, okay, what are we talking about here? We're talking about teaming. We're take, talking about taking a collaborative approach to make sure that we are targeting all the different domains of, of a child to make sure we're meeting their needs. Okay, we're applying our ideas, we're applying our interventions as a group together, cohesive, right, group, um, 
in, in really a student-centered environment. We're including home as, as, as partners um, in this as well. And we're making sure that what we're doing is done in a very systematic way. One that is also meaningful. We never want to um, you know, rush teaching or rush you know, trying to promote change without really looking at all the different areas and fields and, and making sure that we have the right people at the table to help craft um, what ultimately will be a good plan for intervention. So <clears throat> what is um, PBS really? Um, the reactive strategies um, that are most often used. Um, but, uh, you know, we know that there are, they're going to be least reactive. So what positive um, behavior support does is it looks at and focuses strongly on the proactive strategies. I think that what ends up happening is as a parent, as, a, as an educator, the first thing you do is implement reactive strategies, right? So what PBS does is it says, okay, let's take a look at those reactive strategies, see how they have had an impact, and then let's change something about what we're doing so we can prevent those behaviors from happening. And we never really have to deal with managing the behaviors. So PBS looks at proactive, right? Instructional interventions that are the most effective not necessarily focusing heavy on the reactive strategies because we know that there are not going to be long-term durable change or effects, okay? So we're looking at how can we reduce discipline? How can we reduce problem behavior by implementing some proactive strategies? So a couple more things, four different things about PBS here. We need to have a pretty good understanding of behavior which means we're gonna jump into functions. Like, what does this mean? We need to make, make sure we identify ways that we can teach a student in a better way, okay? Or teach your child in the home setting in a better way. Um, a third thing it does, <clears throat> it looks at the environment and we, we, we then determine how can, we, how can this environment be flexible? How can we flex the envir environment around the student's needs? around the child's needs in the community and in the, in the home um, so that we can, again, promote change, promote learning. And then lastly, what it looks at is trying and testing and evaluating until we get it right. I was sitting with a school team today and, you know, folks were asking, what if questions, you know, I was making strong recommendations. I felt that they were clinically sound. They had a lot of questions, which was great. I had a lot of people at the table. We were working together. And at the, you know, there were there was one moment where I said, we're going to try this and we're going to come back next week and see if it was effective or not. And if it wasn't, we're going to change something about what we're doing and we're going to try it again until we get it right. So I never want folks to, to feel like one intervention is like the be all end all. No, it's a work in progress. What you don't want is for too much time to go by without making that change. So that's why we have, you know, data collection systems and we do observations and we team with teachers and educators and related service providers to really get a good feel as to if this intervention is working or not. And by the way, I will also add that before meeting with the team today and delivering my recommendations, I interviewed people. In this case, I couldn't do observations just because of you know, uh, the situation, but I interviewed folks. I looked at data, okay? And then I'm like, all right, let's try this again, right? So we're gonna make some changes here. Um, you know, folks ask me all the time, well, you know, what can we do with the environment? Like, what can we do right now immediately to help um, this particular student? And I start, and I broke it down into like three different buckets here, but it goes deeper than just this, these three buckets. We have to like take each of these apart um, and figure out, okay, how can we provide a consistent and predictable routine and expectation? What does that actually mean? Like, how do we do that? Well, you know, 
is does the child need visual supports? Do they need textual supports? Um, do, do I need to make sure that, you know, the child works initially with one staff or two staff until I get them trained up when there's treatment fidelity? Treatment fidelity means that I know this plan is being implemented consistently each and every moment of the day. Um, how can I make sure I establish routines and expectations that are going to be natural cues for the child for what's coming next? These are all things that you have to think about and then some. Um, we also need to make sure that we provide or offer a, a, a diversity, right, in learning opportunities and methods. Um, sometimes problems or problem behavior exists because the child has just seen too much of the same over and over and over again. And it's it's that moment that we have to take and say, wait, I think it give, goes beyond him just wanting attention or him just wanting to escape a certain demand or activity because they don't want to participate. It goes beyond that. What is it about the environment that they're trying to escape? <clears throat> what is it about the environment that they're trying to seek your attention in a maladaptive way? So we really need to think, right, about how we can adjust the learning opportunities so that they are diverse. Am I going to be doing delivering instruction on an iPad, on a Chromebook, uh, you know, uh, on paper, um, in worksheets, on a smart board, um, in the hallway, on the carpet, standing up on the, you know, on, uh, on a trampoline, taking a You know, how am I going to create opportunities where I can teach this skill in a way that absorb it, okay? Third, we want to make sure we define, teach, and recognize appropriate behaviors and achievements, okay? That is key, key, key. And I'm not just talking about students at, in a school setting here. I'm also talking about how can we as parents define, teach, and recognize appropriate behaviors and achievements, okay? This can happen across all uh, settings. I refer to my clients as students because that's where I do a lot of the work, but I have a clinic, right, too, and um, I'm doing the same sort of interventions there. So don't get hung up on, you know, when I say students, because we're talking about strategies and, and concepts that can be applied across all environments. Um, some other things that we need to think about is um, we really need to reflect on the students and their interests. Um, you know, I, it's funny because I was working with a team today who, you know, I brought up, hey, there's this one reinforcer, this one thing that this child really, really gets really excited about. And I said what it was and they were like, yeah, totally. Right. You, 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 you got it. You heard it wasn't me who found out what it was, but I was a good listener. And that's how I knew what that reinforcer was. Um, but then we need to sort of take a pause and say, or to test that out and see how powerful or how potent that reward or that thing or that reinforcer is for this child and reflect back at, you know, the student and their, their interests today and how they may be different a day from now, a week from now, a month from now, three months from now, interests change over time. Um, so we have to reflect back on that and not rely so, so heavily on what the child has liked for, you know, uh, a period of a short period of time. Um, we don't want our kids to go stale either um, on reinforcers. Um, we want to encourage a sense of community, a sense of belonging. Um, and really what that's going to take is modifications and creativity, making sure that, you know, supports um, are there in order to encourage our children to participate 
in, for example, the you know, a story time at the public library, or um, going out to dinner with a family, um, or um, you know, attending um, you know a unified arts uh, 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 activity or something like that. We really need to make sure we we think about how can we ask yourself how can we encourage a sense of communicated community in this situation. Um, with this particular student, because it could mean so many different things depending on the child's needs. We also need to consider what's developmentally appropriate. Um, as our children get older, it gets harder and harder for us to um, accept um, what a child may gravitate towards or um, want right, to meet their, their needs and their interests. And um, we, we have to be sensitive to that. Um, I work with individuals who are also in a high school setting and their needs are high. Um, they have limited communication skills, limited socialization skills. We're working mostly on teaching them functional, um, functional communication, but also functional daily living skills. And I do, I have to bring our team back and say, all right, it's great, these ideas are great. Have we checked in with the family? Have we checked in with the student? Um, and where can we either meet halfway, considering that we have to also identify you know, their needs and what are the materials or the content and the, and the, the, the lessons? How are we gonna design lessons that are also going to be developmentally appropriate so that they can continue to progress, so that we can teach them the prerequisite skills that they need for much harder or future skills, the ultimate goal. Um, again, encourage belonging and acceptance. And I can't tell you how important it is for there to be collaboration between families, schools, and the community. Um, I provide a lot of consultation within schools. So I rely heavily on, I lean on my special education teacher to communicate. I lean on her just because she's the central hub. Um, but it is really important for all of us to reach out to families when, um, when necessary. Okay. So now this is where I'm going to dive into what I had talked about which is the, um, the functions of behavior. And it's really important for us to understand these before we can really move forward. So um, I'm gonna jump in and say, we need to start talking about replacement behaviors or replacement skill instruction. Anytime I identify that a behavior is occurring for a certain reason, whether it be for attention, that's function number one, or escape or avoidance, function number two, to gain access to a tangible item, that's function number three, or lastly, because they are engaging in the behavior to gain some kind of sensory feedback, right? To relieve some kind of pain, Okay, so pain attenuation. That's the fourth function. That fourth function is called automatic. Okay, I'm engaging in this because behavior because it feels good. I'm engaging in this behavior because it's relieving some kind of pain. Okay, so those are the, two, the four different functions. When I identify the function of behavior, and sometimes it's multiple. Sometimes the kid will escape or avoid doing something and then ha, 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 wants attention. <laughs> and you're like, oh my goodness, how do I gain control all over again? So when I have those four different functions, I then I'm going to say, okay, for these behaviors, now that I understand what their functions are, I need to now start to identify what the replacement behaviors are for each problem behavior or challenging behavior or maladaptive behavior, right? We need to be able to produce enduring, long-lasting behavior change. Why? 
because we want to make sure that our students, our children are participating in socially appropriate ways, right? So that they can access different activities so that they can access the community. They don't necessarily, if you're, if you have a child who's engaging in challenging behavior, it's not ne necessarily common that they will say, Hey, you know what? If I engage in this other behavior, it's probably easier, right? I shouldn't engage in that behavior. Well, of course they're engaging in that behavior because they're, they're getting something out of it. Okay. Um, but teaching them these replacement behaviors are really going to help with um, promoting the skill of negotiating, okay? Our kids need to know how to negotiate life challenges, okay? And by teaching them these replacement behaviors, they're going to be in a better position to help negotiate what their needs are in, um, in the community. So again, Teaching alternative, more appropriate functional skills to replace problem behavior is the real task, okay? We can sit here and talk about functions all day long. We can sit here and talk about the different ways that I can figure that all out. But the real task at the end of the day is what are we gonna do, right? To teach this kid a replacement behavior so that they're no longer relying on the problem behavior. They're no longer relying on the problem behavior. Okay. So here are a couple different rules and here's what you're going to add to your toolbox. Okay. General rules that I have established for intervention. Rule number one, always address the function of behavior. Always address it. You have to take a look at the function of the behavior. You need to determine why it's happening. Okay. Understand it really, really well before you start to identify what we're going to do differently. Rule number two, for every behavior that you want to decrease, you better have one to increase. Okay. That's just the rule. Um, if you want to increase engagement and in activities, right, uh, we need to make sure that we do that through skill building and reinforcement. More of what you want them to do, unless you have really strong reinforcement. So you can't just say, I'm going to teach you this and not deliver any reinforcement. Okay. I don't continue to work if I don't get paid. Okay. I also don't continue to work if people are not nice, right? If I enjoy the people that I work with, I'm going to continue to go to work. Why? Because I'm looking forward to that verbal and social praise. I'm looking for that reinforcement. I'm looking for that feedback. I'm looking for people to say I'm doing a good job. Okay. So I continue to go and I continue to end up showing up, right? And, and working with teams. People are nasty and they're not reinforcing. I'm not going to continue to engage in that appropriate behavior of showing up. Right. So same thing applies here. We need to make sure that we're building those skills and we're providing reinforcement. Okay. So what do I mean by the function of behavior? So sorry, sorry to interrupt. There's a question in the chat. Um, what yeah. do you mean by the function of the behavior? Can you give an example? Yes, of course. So let's say, um, let's say a child is being presented with, and it's just very overwhelming. Um, they're, they're presenting, they're presented with a math worksheet. Okay. And, and um, it's just a lot on the page. It's like 10 different math problems. Uh, they're having a hard time understanding how to break those problems uh, down into small Our components um, and to them, or a different math worksheet, or in this format, the child gets up and runs out of the, the, the room and is like, I can't do this. This is too hard. But, you know, I, I refuse to do it. No, no, no. Right. So, you know, someone will call me and say, Wait a minute, can you come and take a look at this? Because we're not sure why this child is engaging in this type of behavior. And I'll go in and I'll take a look and I'll say, okay, 
seems like every time he's presented with a math worksheet that is this technical and it's not broken down, he gets up, he bolts and he, you know, he's very upset. So I'm going to say, hmm, there's a pattern here. There's a pattern of engaging in this behavior to escape. Okay. Cause remember those were, I said, there are four functions, attention, escape, gaining access to a tangible item and fourth automatic. Right. In the case and the example that I'm giving you, the child is engaging in the problem behavior. And I've seen a pattern. I have data to show to escape. He doesn't want to, he doesn't want to do that math worksheet. I think we're going to have to figure out how to present him with that same uh, uh, work, but in a different format. Okay. So that's what I mean by functions. behavior. You're trying to answer the question as to why a behavior is happening. Does that make sense? So the four different functions, just so that you all are aware, are attention, escape, avoidance, which is one. Okay. That's, that's one category. Tangible, they're trying to gain um, access to a tangible item and automatic. Okay. So those are the four different functions of um, behavior. Then, oops, last um, is rule number five. We want to make sure that we know what are the kids strengths and weaknesses and how do they contribute to their organizational skills, their understanding of the expectations, their anxiety, their level of arousal, right? Their learning, how, how they process information, how, how, how they're life is structured and, and, and predictable. We need to understand what they do, how they excel, what, where their strengths are so that we can say, okay, I think I can pull from these strengths to really hone in on an intervention that I know that they're going to be really good at, right? So, so let me give you an example. I have um, elementary schoolers who um, probably by like third, fourth, and fifth grade, mostly fourth and fifth grade, um, we, they, have, they have built, right, a good sort of repertoire of skills. Um, they have reinforcement systems that are run by their paraprofessionals or the classroom teacher. They're excelling in, you know, uh, managing their routine and their schedule. Um, you know, it could be you know, it could, it could even be someone who's non-vocal and they are managing with, you know, pictures, maybe they're using PECs, maybe they're using their AAC device, whatever. And I will stop and I will say, ah, okay, this is now a fourth grader, almost fifth grader, about to go in about a year and a half to middle school, who has all these strengths that we have, right, these skills that we have worked on. So hard. Um, I want to try and see if this child would respond to now monitor their, monitoring their own behavior. So I may consider recommending a self-monitoring system, right? It takes them to the next level. It's honestly, it's appro more appropriate going into the middle school only and only if it makes sense, right? For that. And the areas of need their environment to really address any behavioral concerns that they may be having. Okay. What are replacement behaviors? I've already talked about this, but this is a quick review again. Skills that allow the student to meet their own needs, communicate needs, negotiate their environment, or regulate own actions. That is what replacement skills are. Oops, sorry, there we go. Why do we wanna teach replacement skills? We wanna decrease dependency on prompts. We wanna expand their competence to negotiate life's challenges. We wanna increase social appropriateness and we wanna replace behavior with more appropriate alternative behavior, okay? Replacement, replacement skills um, are just like any other academic skill, okay? 
I have a problem behavior. I now need to figure out what to teach them to do instead. Um, we do this in a, in a way, hopefully, that we can show them what they need to do. They then, we can coach them and lead them. We can test to see if they're doing it. And then we can give them feedback with, through reinforcement. Okay. There are a couple of things that I want you to consider. Um, always asking yourself, right? If I need to teach a certain skill, how will I model this skill in a way that the child will, will grasp it? How will I provide supported practice opportunities that they're not going to resist? This is an important item. And ask away, ask questions if what I'm saying doesn't necessarily make sense because I will probably have to say it in like three different ways. When I look at teaching a replacement behavior or a replacement skill, I'm looking at a way to decrease the response effort so that you end up or the child ends up figuring out that it's so much easier to just do this alternative behavior or the replacement behavior. Let me give you an example. Let's say I want a child to um, communicate that they are, um, that they want something, anything. Let's just say it's um, use of the iPad because that one's a popular one, okay? And the child previously had no way of communicating that they wanted the iPad. Um, they are, I'll describe the child. It's a child who is non-vocal, non-verbal, okay? Um, and uh, has not really been taught sign um, can lead you to what it is that they want, but uh, not consistently. And what they have learned to do is they have learned to engage in maladaptive behavior, let's say hitting a staff, screaming, maybe even engaging in some self-injurious behavior, pulling their own hair, because they're frustrated that they can't communicate to you that they just want to play on the iPad. So once I start to identify, right, that the function of, or I have identified, I've seen a pattern, the function of this behavior is they're engaging in self-injurious behavior, aggression towards you and screaming. I'm just going to put it in there, right? Because I'm going to then stop and say, okay, what replacement behavior do I want instead? Instead of pulling your own hair, aggressing towards people and screaming, I would like this child to just point to a picture of the iPad so that they can get it, okay? There are some limitations too that you're gonna to wanna to put around them, right? Every time they hit that picture, point to that picture, you're gonna get the iPad, right? But then you're gonna to wanna to set some limits, okay? because you don't want them doing that all day long and not learning anything else. But what I have done is I have decreased the response effort. I'm not going to ask them to produce a request verbally because that would take a lot of work. I describe this child as a non-verbal, non-vocal child that they rely on taking you and guiding you to things. So why would I ask them to produce something verbally? While the speech pathologist and the AT specialist are working on programming the iPad or the, the, the AAC device so that he now has a different mode of communication, I'm gonna say, that's great. That's wonderful. Ultimately, that's where we wanna go, right? Family's on board, everyone, okay, is on board. Then I'm gonna say, okay, Go program that. In the meantime, 
rather than me require him to navigate through these pages on his AAC device, find what it is that you need him to push in order for him to request time on his iPad, I'm just going to put this picture on his desk. And anytime he touches that picture, he gets the iPad. Okay. That is decreasing response effort. Okay. It's making it super easy to teach that replacement behavior. You got it, buddy. You asked me appropriately. You did not aggress towards me. You didn't pull your own hair. You didn't scream. You did it. You got it. Eventually, I'll set some limitations. Well, you touch that picture, you get iPad, but you only get two minutes. <laughs> or you get five minutes, two minutes, okay? Or what I may do is I may say, okay, for the day, buddy, for this day, you will have 10 oppor 20 opportunities to ask for the iPad. But when you run out of those pictures, right, that means you run out of the, you've asked enough and you, you've run out, right, of those opportunities. Um, so that is what I'm talking about here with making sure that you, re you reduce response effort, make it really easy for this child to, to learn this replacement behavior, this replacement skill. You also want to ask yourself, how will I provide feedback and support? Um, constructive feedback. Um, am I going to, how am I going to correct this child when they're not responding uh, with the, you know, with the with the response that I want with the replacement behavior. How rich does my schedule of reinforcement need to be? What is the quality of the feedback need to be? Is social praise even appropriate at this point because he doesn't really care, or you know, do I lean on giving him a tangible item? paired with social praise and verbal praise, because ultimately you want the child, right, to do things and to receive reinforcement from the natural environment rather than it be this thing that needs to happen. What supports am I going to need to teach this replacement skill? Is it visuals? Is it auditory supports? Are there going to be different materials, technology? You're gonna ask yourself all those questions. <laughs> and how will I embed prompts in the natural environment to help the student use the skill? Because ultimately what we want is for them to use or demonstrate that replacement skill in the natural environment. We want them to environment rich, embed those natural cues, okay? And then boop, it happens, right? Hopefully spontaneously, and you jump in and you reinforce the heck out of that new behavior, right? Because again, that new behavior is actually now a waste of my time. It's so much easier for me to touch this picture and get my iPad, okay? So that's everything that you really need to consider when teaching any new skill. Um, at home, at school, try it, pick one behavior, make sure you have a good reinforcement attached to that behavior. Um, make sure you look at the environment and say, how can I make it so that this kid can easily engage in that replacement behavior? Test it out, do it on your own. Um, so I'm going to jump into some different types of alternative or, or replacement skills that, um, that you should know about that are important. One of them, I already gave you an example of, that's functional communication training. What the example that I provided with the icon, with the iPad, that's functional communication training. I'm teaching a child how to communicate effectively, right? Um, so that they don't, they're not relying on the replacement behavior. Um, it's also teaching communicative behaviors that are functionally equivalent to the maladaptive behaviors, and it results in an increase in the former or a decrease in the latter, okay? So I didn't come up with this. This is actually a thing that, you know, someone sort of packaged and is marketed, right, as an intervention. But it makes sense. Um, 
If I know how to communicate my needs all day long, I would not necessarily have to rely on engaging in problem behavior, okay? So when doing functional communication training, there are a number of components that are yoked to it, okay? You wanna make sure you define the target behavior. What is it that you wanna teach, okay, specifically? Conduct a functional assessment, right, to determine what the communicative intended is, okay? So you, you don't want to, uh, you wanna teach to the function. You, you wanna make sure that the intervention matches the reason why a child's engaging in the behavior, which is number three. And then identify potential reinforcers, okay? And your reinforcers need to be pretty strong. Okay, um, you wanna make sure that um, they're potent. You need to make sure that maybe you even isolate them. When I say isolate them, it means maybe you can't access that reinforcer anywhere else, except when you engage in that behavior, right? That we're teaching you to engage in to replace all of the other junk, right? That you're doing. And then uh, lastly, you wanna identify the communication needs for the child's response. Is that to target? Is that sort of what is going to be the easiest thing for the child to do? Um, using uh, icons on their AAC device or mechanical, you know, is it going to be a tape recorded message on an augmented communication device? Okay, um, I have used Big Macs, um, especially with some of my students who are not necessarily able to um, motor-wise, you know, like fine motor and gross motor, really navigate, you know, situations well. So they have some limitations around, you know, sort of the, the their movements. Sometimes I will program a response, you know. I want iPad and I'll put it on a big back because I know that the child is able to maybe um, uh, operate their wheelchair with their hand and, and move that pretty effectively. I may say, I'm going to make this really easy too for them. I'm going to add a big Mac to the side of where they're, you know, um, where they're uh, uh, not mouse. Oh, geez, I lost my words. But anyways, where their navigation, where, where they, you know, the, 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 the thing that they use to, to move their wheelchair, I'm so sorry, I can't remember what it's called. But I may put a Big Mac next to it and say, all right, it, it's easy access, right? And this way it's available to you whenever you need it. So I'm not going to, right, require verbal, but I may just require you to touch the Big Mac and dude, you can have iPad every time you do that, as long as you're not, hitting anybody, pulling your own hair or doing anything that's maladaptive. Um, and I'm sorry, there, is, there are more. So teach um, the desired appropriate communicative alternative, of course, right? Make sure that you're doing these in real life situations. Um, make sure that they're functional. Make sure that they're meaningful. Um, check in with the family. I mean, the, the check in with the school, check in with, you know, your, you know, the people that are gonna be involved in teaching functional communication. And then, oh, please evaluate. Please evaluate if what you're doing is actually working or not. You don't want to go weeks without knowing if something is effective or not. You wanna know when you need to make those modifications or when you need to tap into that expert to say, hey, I need your help. All right, I'm going to talk about a few reinforcement procedures, okay? And I realize that we have 12 minutes left. Um, but I feel like this is important and we'll get through as much as we can get through. Um, and I'd be happy to um, uh, chat further about this offline. Just reach out to me and I can, of course, you know, guide you to literature or maybe YouTube or maybe another training um, through, through Wilton's Bednet that may be helpful. Um, so uh, reinforcement procedures. Procedures Reinforcement are basically is a procedure that's meant or designed to fit well with the learner's preferences, okay? Their interests and their environment, okay? Their, the procedures must be 
functional, so they must make sense. Okay, they must be able to 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 be applied um, in throughout their their lives or their day to day activities. Um, and all people, all staff must participate, of course, in the initial implementation of this because we don't want you know someone who's not trained to ignore the response that you just worked so hard to train. If a child is now hitting that picture or that Big Mac requesting iPad and that other person who has no idea what we're doing is not reinforcing it and not acknowledging it and not granting it, you may have put in weeks of teaching this skill. And what do we then start to see? We start seeing problem behavior happen all over again, okay? So you wanna make sure that this is um, happening. It's happening contingently. So uh, we need to make sure that it's immediate, consistently and um, continuously. So we want to make sure that th we prevent the, uh, we, we don't allow it to sort of fall and we're not consistent. We want to make sure that um, the reinforcement was delivered immediately after the, make sure that it's uh, continuous, okay? Um, I think our biggest mistake is, okay. So, um, folks will sometimes, well, I don't think, I think he's not necessarily engaged um, in the classroom experience or he's not or she's not in, you know engaged or functionally engaged in um and what is actually occurring it's it's not really motivating um so i'm asked like how can we increase you know engagement how can we increase participation how can we make this happen for this this particular student or or even in the home setting how can we make going out to dinner engaging um there are a few different uh, things that I, I usually talk about, and that's, um, you know, is the task or is the activity interesting to the student um, or person, child? Um, if possible, I want to identify things that are inherently re rewarding, um, and that's where I want to start. I want to make sure that whatever it is, that it's easily accessible or it's frequently available. I want to also make sure that it's within the the, the client's capacity, right? Maybe things are just too hard or maybe it's boring, okay? Um, I have a, actually, I have another student or a patient that I saw yesterday and his lack of engagement is because he's super bored. Um, and then I want to also make sure that it's functional, that it's meaningful, that it can be used and generalized. I never want to, um, you know, uh, uh, have somebody participate in something that is not, it's not meaningful um, to them, right? As a person, as an individual, like how does this apply to me? Um, so you may want to ask, you know, you may want to interview the student. Um, you may want to talk to your son or daughter. Um, you may want to observe, right? If they're not able to necessarily communicate verbally to you what's going on, but just observe their interactions um, with the environment and, and see what's what. Um, another strategy that I want to throw out there that goes beyond reinforcement and also encouraging engagement is choice making. Um, you have probably heard about this. I mean, everyone's to always says, well, give them choices, give them choices. Can't tell you how important this is. Um, in the example of today where I was, you know, working with a group, I said, all right, why don't we give this student more choices. Maybe they're trying to communicate that I don't want to do this right now. Okay. And they're escaping in a way that's just maladaptive. Provide more choices. Do you want to go for a walk? Do you want to drink of water? Do you want to go on the swing? Right. Allow them to have control, right, over their lives. Eventually, yes, with the, some limitations. But right now, if I'm dealing with maladaptive behavior that is disruptive, that's interrupting learning, that's just driving a family nuts, okay, 
right now I'm going to focus on, listen, I'm going to give you choices. You have control over your life. Okay. I'm going to teach you to tell us what it is that you want to do and when you want to do it. And then down the line, I'm going to start tweaking it. Right. So now you allow me to, right. Make a choice. And I say, okay, you make a choice. Now it's my turn to make a choice as to what we're going to do today and how we're going to do it and how long we're going to do it. So, um, choice making involves choosing between two functional alternatives. I would push it to three if possible. Right. Do you want to work or do you want to take a break? Do you want to work on math or spelling first? Right. Sometimes even giving yes, no choices. Right. Um, if, if it's functional, um, I tend to say, let's not do the yes, no, um, just because I don't know if it's reliable. Okay. But what is more reliable is actually presenting the two items, presenting the two pictures, presenting the two activities or asking, would you like to do this or that? Okay. Um, and, oh, sorry. And when presenting yes, no choices, the kids tend to end up saying no. So I don't want to be in a situation where everything's no. I want to be in a situation where I'm like, hey, I'm presenting with you with these two different choices. What do you think? Let's make a choice here. Again, visual supports for choice may be added. Um, initially, I may want to limit the choice options, offer choice options that are uh, that you are willing to accept. Oh my goodness. So many times choices, like people get grandiose and they start thinking of great ideas. to follow through with at the end. Um, and with choices comes responsibility, right? We need to make sure we, we, we also teach that choice making means, hey, you made a choice, but you now have to follow through um, and provide a ton of reinforcement for making that choice, right? Um, allow them to know, right? Encourage and acknowledge that, you know, they're working with you and this is great news. All right, so I know we're nearing the end. Um, I just want to check, Allie, if we have any questions or if there are any comments with the content. I know that a few folks were like, hey, what are the functions of the behavior? Can you provide some examples? Um, I don't see anything that's popped up on my screen in the chat or in the questions and answer. So um, no, I don't see any either. That said, typically at the end, um, people start thinking of questions, then it goes, they start posting it. But um, you can keep talking until people do. <laughs> okay. All right. That, that sounds good. So um, I'll say one more thing about reinforcement um, and that is deferential reinforcement. This is sounds, it could be intimidating. It's kind of a deferential reinforcement. Like what is that? All right. So um, it's basically identifying uh, what you actually want to reinforce and what you want to get rid of. Okay. Um, with deferential reinforcement, you don't want to reinforce the maladaptive behavior. So you're going to reinforce behavior. So anything else goes. Um, there are, it gets really technical. I could probably do a whole class on deferential reinforcement. There are a few different types of um, deferential reinforcement systems. Deferential reinforcement system of other behavior, incompatible behavior, alternative behavior, and high and low rates of behavior. Okay, so there are many different types of systems that fall under deferential reinforcement. But um, in short, uh, given the time, also is either we want to reinforce anything but the challenging behavior or I re want to reinforce only their alternative behaviors to the challenging behavior, so the replacement behaviors, or I want to reinforce the behaviors that are incompatible, that can't be done at the same time as a challenging behavior, or behaviors that I want to see more of or less of, okay? That's technically what it is. Um, so, you know, again, this is a longer um, conversation, um, but, I'd be happy to, to, to guide people to the information that they need in the event that they wanna learn um, more about that. So here's my contact information in the event you wanna reach out and say, hey, can you, can you share some of those articles? Can you, um, you know, direct me to a resource or somebody in my community that could help? Um, 
totally open to it. Here's my contact information um, and feel free to, to shoot me an email and then I'll wait for questions. Last chance, guys, if you have any questions, this would be the time to, to ask Salandi. I don't see anything. I think this was so much that um, people have to digest it first. And then <laughs> <No>. back, <laughs> maybe come back with it. But that was terrific. Thank you. Thank you so much. And so um, everybody next next week, same time, um, Solandi is going to talk about boosting ind independence. And um, we'll see. We'll see you then. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for having and, me. And thank you so much for giving out your your info because I have a feeling people will be able to read, will be reaching out to you then. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you, Salandi. Thanks so All right. much. Thank Next you. Bye-bye. Okay. Thanks, everyone. I'll end it now. Bye. Thanks, everyone.